Hello and welcome back. A surge in energy prices has left Europe facing its most profound increase in inflation in a generation. It is unlikely to be the last time we see this. The war in Ukraine and the green energy transition are set to trigger unprecedented changes in one of the economy's most important markets. Central bankers must, therefore, refine how they think about energy prices and how they affect the outlook for inflation. This year's first panel will look at the latest thinking on how officials can better understand the implications of these shifts on their work. It will be chaired by ECB Executive Board Member Isabel Schnabel. Dr. Schnabel, over to you. Thank you so much, Claire, for the uh, introduction and um, good afternoon. I think we can say that now <laughs> to everybody, especially, of course, to my, to my four distinguished uh, panelists. It's a very great, great pleasure to welcome you to our panel on structural change in energy markets and implications for inflation. So um, energy prices uh, clearly remain a key driver of inflation dynamics in the euro area. The marked decline in headline inflation in the euro area was, to a large extent, driven by falling energy price inflation. And we saw that other inflation components like food prices and co-inflation are also heavily impacted by developments in the energy sector, albeit with substantial lags. And at last year's Sintra Forum, we uh, discussed the impact of rising energy prices on macroeconomic developments in Europe and around uh, the world, and also the implications for monetary policy. So this year, uh, as the President asked us to do, we are going to look a bit more into, into the future. So we, uh, we are going to focus on uh, the ongoing structural changes in energy markets and their impact on the outlook for energy prices and inflation. So what are the future shocks that, uh, that we um, um, may need to expect going, uh, going forward and uh, what kind of shocks will that be? So a discussion of energy markets is important as the volatility of energy prices is likely to persist for some time, especially given the fundamental changes to be expected in light of geopolitical shifts on the one hand and the green transition on the other hand. And this volatility is going uh, to continue to contribute to the uncertainty of the macroeconomic environment and uh, it will also affect our inflation outlook. And for this reason, we as central banks are monitoring closely what is happening in the energy market and we need to deepen our understanding of uh, the functioning of energy markets and incorporate, incorporate relevant structural changes also in our projection models. And to be able to do that, uh, we rely on the support from experts like our excellent uh, panelists with whom I have the pleasure to discuss over the coming 90 minutes. Each of the panelists is going to make introductory remarks of no more than 10 minutes each, and then I uh, will give the panelists a chance to react uh, to each other before I will then open uh, the floor for the Q&A. And of course, our online participants uh, are also very much welcome uh, to ask questions, so if you would like to ask a question, please uh, raise your virtual hand. But let me, uh, let me start with the first speaker. Um, who is uh, Javier Blas. Uh, he is a Bloomberg uh, opinion columnist based in London dealing with energy and uh, commodities. He's also the author of a fascinating uh, book on commodity markets, The World for Sale. If you haven't read it, I, I recommend reading it because it's really fascinating. It's a different world, I, I would say, from the one we know. And this book shows uh, quite plainly uh, that uh, Javier has an exceptional understanding of what is really going on in global energy and commodity markets. And so, uh, Javier, we're very uh, much looking forward to learning from you what's really going on in these markets. Thanks for being here. Uh, many thanks, Isabel, and uh, thank you to the ECB for his kind invitation, and also thank you to the Banco de Portugal for his hospitality here in, in, in Sintra. I'm a Spaniard, and I can say that I'm absolutely marveled by, by this city, so um, that, that goes a, a lot, as, as Portuguese people will know. Uh, the views are all my own, including about Portugal. Uh, global commodity markets have experienced extreme price volatility over the last three years due to several large 
consecutive and at times overlapping supply and demand shocks. In particular, the cost of energy commodities, including crude oil, natural gas, coal, and propane, surged to a nominal high in 2022, well above historical norms. And if I may have the first slide of the presentation. Uh, the price volatility was, uh, uh, no, that is, thank you, pardon. There you are. That is uh, the IMF energy index. It measures, um, uh, as I said, crude oil, natural gas, coal, and propane. As you could see, the, the price spike was very significant and well above what we have seen in, in previous peaks, including just before the global uh, financial crisis in 2007, 2008. That price volatility was amplified at times by disorderly trading in poorly regulated financial and physical commodity markets here in Europe and elsewhere in the world. The lack of circuit breakers meant that markets could suffer significant intraday price swings in some occasions, particularly in electricity and natural gas. Short squeezes triggered by record large, large margin calls also add significantly to the volatility. And in some cases, what we saw was artificial pricing just triggered by the need to reduce positions due to margin calls and not for any fundamentals. I will make here an aside, if you allow me, based on this chart with data from the IMF. The IMF monitors 68 different commodities around the world, crude oil, uh, natural gas, coal, propane, in energy, wheat, soybeans, corn, uh, metals, uh, fertilizers. It does not, among those 68 commodities, includes the price of electricity. And, and I, I see the same in some central banks, and I think it's a big miss on what we are seeing. In some ways, we are looking at the economy as we were still in 1973, and oil was the main energy of the planet, when electricity is taking over. Look at this room. The main source of this room is electricity, no crude oil, no natural gas. And if you look at the, particularly the service sector, think about what is the biggest energy cost of the service sector. On most occasions, that is electricity. If my hairdresser told me last time I was there that from the 1st of July, the price of my haircut is going to go 10% up, in part is because that hairdresser is still adjusting to higher electricity prices. And Contrary to what I have heard uh, in previous panels, I will argue that the energy shock has not ended. I think that it is still persistent, and consumers and small and medium companies in particular are adapting to a higher structural cost of energy, particularly for electricity. When you look at electricity prices, the analogy that I like to do is oil looks like a wave that hits you. You are on the beach and you know, it's a big of a, a, a windy day and the waves are hitting you and they, they will hit you on the face. They are very fast. They come very fast energy, oil shocks. Electricity is more like the tide. It comes very slowly. It takes time. But if you are in low ground, you will drown also. And, and that difference is why I think that the electricity, the electricity price shock is very important to, to monitor. Also because most consumers enter into relatively long-term contracts, one year, one and a half years longer. And some consumers, particularly small and medium enterprises, enter into contracts last year at peak levels that they are going to stay with us for 12, 18 months. So it's going to take a significant amount of time before we see disinflation coming on electricity. I will focus uh, in the next few minutes um, in a couple of uh, areas. What happened in physical and financial commodity markets and a, a brief summary of how those markets work and also the important but I think unappreciated role of the commodity traders. First on the markets. The commodity markets in reality are a complex web of interlinked markets. A different of equity and other security markets, we start with a physical market where goods are exchanged for immediate delivery. That is the spot physical market. Someone buys or sells a barrel of oil or a cargo of oil, a ton of aluminum, a bushel of wheat. And that is done today on the physical market without intervention of the financial market. We have also forward physical markets where physical goods are also interchanged for future delivery. And above all of those markets that they are physical in their nature, we have financial or derivatives markets where participants can hedge risk can speculate on the, on the direction of, of the market. Those um, financial or deri derivative markets can be over the counter, bilateral, private, or can be done on exchange and, and clear. And at times, both markets are interlinked. 
you can take a position on the physical market, hold the contract to delivery, uh, to expiry, and then take physical delivery of the commodity. So the financial market has a link to the physical market and vice versa. Uh, you also what happened on electricity and gas markets in Europe over the last 18 months, and those receive most of the attention by policymakers alongside with oil. But we have seen um, price volatility in many other markets um, from nickel, a uh, uh, um, commodity used for stainless steel, where we saw in London at one point the price move about 250% over a 36 hours period, although later some of the trade was canceled. Uh, we saw it um, in uh, the price of wheat, the price of soybean, and unfortunately we are seeing ongoing on the price of olive oil, which is a significant cause for my household. <laughs> Why prices surge as much as they did? Well, there is a culprit above everything else, and it's the, Russia in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Without that, we will not have suffered the amount of price inflation that we saw in the system. But there was significantly more to that. We have, in particular, in global energy markets, first, an unprecedented demand contraction during COVID. At some point, we lost 20% of global oil demand. Uh, no one was taking a plane. We were at home under lockdown. Later, the market, uh, OPEC and other producers reacted to that, imposing production cuts to try to uh, avoid uh, excess surplus accumulating into the market. Uh, and the production cuts were historically large. It took a long time for us to see the impact of those cuts, but OPEC at one point cut more than 10 million barrels a day of, of production. That's more than 10% of global oil production in one go. That was the largest ever production cut I have seen from, uh, from a cartel. Then demand reopened, uh, the economies reopened, and demand came back, perhaps not as fast as it disappeared, but certainly it surprised many market participants. Uh, OPEC also decided to keep the market artificially tight in an effort, in part, to recover tons of trade. OPEC countries import a lot of their manufacturers, and they have suffered also for inflation. The purchasing power of the barrel is not what it used to be. A barrel of oil, I did recently uh, an exercise, and I look what is the purchasing power of a barrel measured by furniture from IKEA. It buys you exactly what it used to buy you in 2005. Um, so you go to the till on an IKEA shop with a barrel of oil, impossible as it is. I don't think that they take that mean of, of transaction, perhaps Bitcoin, but not barrels of oil. Uh, you, you will not be able to get much of it. And OPEC is trying to reverse that, that negative terms of trade that is, is suffering. Electricity prices reacted for higher natural gas, expensive CO2 credit emissions, expensive coal. The price of coal, unappreciated, went from $100 to $400 in the space of six months. And also, in certain countries in Europe, lower than expected nuclear generation and also hydroelectric generation. Uh, the impact of climate change not only at times increased the demand for electricity, perhaps for air conditioning, but at times also reduced the ability to produce electricity because we don't have as much water in, in hydroelectric uh, installations. But there is also a bigger trend in energy markets that is very important and I, at times goes unappreciated. The global fossil fuel industry is investing enough for a world that is moving to meet net zero by 2050 uh, demand and supply targets. And the supply is heading into that direction. Unfortunately, the demand is not heading into that direction. While the industry is investing for a world of net zero, demand continues to grow. And this year, most likely, we'll see record oil demand, record gas demand, and unfortunately, also record coal demand. And that's interesting. The demand for coal in 2023 most likely will hit an all-time high. And that's coming many, many years after the first climate change initiative in, in the, period, the first serious one in, in Kyoto. Let me discuss now the role of, of the commodity trading industry. As commodity prices increased uh, last year and also in 2021, we witnessed a massive transfer of wealth from consumers, and in many cases also from governments who were buying commodities on behalf of consumers or subsidizing them to producers. What's largely missed in this debate is the significant proportion of that rent transfer went from consumers into the pockets of intermediaries, and those are the commodity traders. And by commodity traders, I don't mean big, uh, big Wall Street investment banks, but I mean a small group of companies, most of them privately owned, most of them also headquartered here in Europe, um, 
that uh, buy and sell physical commodities, and they hedge and speculate also in, in financial markets. The financing of this industry is also largely coming from Europe. It's done by European commercial banks, not big investment banks, but actually the kinds of banks that will have a high street office and will extend a mortgage to uh, consumers like me. How profitable was 2022 for those commodity traders? Well, that's how profitable it was. Uh, those are the four largest commodity traders. I should say that some of those commodity traders don't only trade, but also produce some commodities. They mine, they perhaps produce some oil, or they, they, they are in the meatpacking industry. But Glencore is the world's largest commodity trader, largest uh, metal trader, Beetle, largest oil trader, Cargill, largest grain trader, Trafigura, big player in both oil and gas. And you could see uh, the volatility, uh, sorry, you could see the net income. That is uh, profit after tax. Uh, in billions of dollars. Um, we don't have many data on the industry. It's very opaque. Some of them are, most of them are privately owned, so they don't have to report. But that is paradigmatic of the rest of the industry. You ask a CEO of the commodity traders, and you will get similar information from, from other companies. Return on equity, that most businesses will be happy to have return on equity of perhaps 10, 15, 20% return on equity. Return on equity for many in the industry was 100% last year. In some cases, it was 200, 250%. These are highly leveraged businesses. Uh, the recipe for obtaining these, these, these margins, uh, those profits, is very simple. You buy and sell many, many times in different locations, in different forms, and try to make a buck, exploiting and arbitraging the price difference. For that, ones need to take risks, and at times, significant risks. And last year was very risky. Uh, we don't have many data about how much risk, value at risk the industry takes, because again, these are privately owned companies in general. But we have data from Glencore, which listed in 2011 in the London Stock Exchange, and is headquartered in Switzerland. And as you could see, value at risk for Glencore, this is one day, 95% interval, average for the year, exploded in uh, 2022. At some point, Glencore, very similar to many others in the industry, lifted completely all the value at risk limits and they traded without any limits whatsoever. That is the uh, average value at risk for the year, which I think, if I remember, top of my head is $158 million. But the peak, the single day peak, was $451 million, uh, and mostly on the back of LNG and gas trading. And with this industry, that seems quite important to understand energy commodity markets, uh, how much we know about them, how we regulate this industry. Well. Let me tell you that the commodity traders have largely escaped regulatory scrutiny in the European Union. And that's not my statement. I have a much better source. That's what the European Central Bank said in a review six years ago. We also know that the sector is opaque, is highly leveraged, and suffers from liquidity mismatches. That also comes from the ECB. The IMF told us earlier this year that some very large traders are private companies. They are subject to very limited or no public report, reporting requirements. And what worries me the most is what we don't know that we don't know about the sector, particularly considering the size of the margin calls that we saw last year, some market failures and exchange failures like the London Metal Exchange. And those unknowns, unknowns, as our famous uh, Secretary of Defense of the United States used to say, is what worries me. And considering the experience of the last three years, I think it would be better that we know more about the sector. Is regulation needed? I will leave that for you policymakers to decide. But will I, I'll, I, will agree, I will argue is that we need more oversight and that the commodity trading sector is too large to ignore. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Javier. So this brings me uh, to our second speaker. I'm uh, delighted to welcome Christiane Baumeister, who is Lambert Family Professor of Economics at the University of Notre Dame. And she's also an empirical macroeconomist and a leading expert on the dynamics of energy markets and the transmission of monetary policy. And in her remarks, she's going to focus on structural changes in global oil markets and what uh, they imply for inflation. So Christiane, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours, and I would be uh, very grateful if you could stick to the 10 minutes. Okay. Um, we don't see the time 
here, so that's a bit yeah, that's uh, that's a bit uh, the problem. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to uh, um, be part of uh, of this panel. Uh, well, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in early 2020 set in motion a sequence of structural changes in global energy markets, which were reinforced by the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine only uh, two years later. Now, these dramatic events triggered unprecedented policy uh, interventions and played an important role in the recent surge of inflation. And that's, in a nutshell, uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So um, let's start by looking at some of the changes on the supply side of um, the global oil market, where I will focus on the world's three largest um, oil producers, the U.S., uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Russia. The U.S. shale oil sector has been hit very hard by uh, the pandemic and uh, production growth since then has been very slow uh, to pick up again because of the existence of a number of uh, physical constraints and um, uh, demands from um, the corporate side in terms of um, imposing capital discipline and um, generating returns for uh, shareholders. In fact, um, the uh, U.S. shale oil sector has shifted to a new business model um, that prioritizes generating returns for investors over expanding um, production in response to higher oil prices, which um, used to be uh, the status quo before uh, the pandemic. And this is also reflected in indicators of drilling activity, um, which uh, while recovering from um, the, the pandemic recently um, show a, uh, a reversal and a marked uh, slowdown. So the key takeaway here is that the U.S. is likely no longer, uh, is likely not going back um, to its earlier role as uh, the new swing producer. And in fact, the pendulum has swung back to some extent um, to OPEC under uh, the leadership of um, of Saudi Arabia. Now, one issue that has become evident um, during the, uh, uh, the recovery from the pandemic is that some OPEC members um, really struggle to fulfill uh, their quotas. So there is consistent underproduction um, from a number of, uh, of member, member countries, which together with the low levels of spare capacity um, limits OPEC's flexibility uh, to stabilize the market. And um, while um, you can see from the graph that um, uh, spare capacity has been low before the pandemic, what is new and what needs to be taken into account is um, that in this new setting, um, where other um, major oil producers face enduring constraints, and here I'm thinking in particular uh, of the U.S. and potentially um, Russia, as I will detail in a moment, um, uh, that kind of, uh, the, the severity of this lack of spare capacity has uh, increased. Um, the Russian crude oil market is undergoing also uh, a major transformation since the invasion of Ukraine. Now, as Russia lost its traditional customer base, in particular um, uh, uh, Europe, uh, the composition of its buyers has changed um, quite dramatically, as you can see um, in the, the graph below here, where um, China and India are now uh, the top importers. The first line indicates um, the start of um, the war in, in Ukraine. And uh, the blue part, which uh, stands for the EU, um, has decreased dramatically. Now, this um, change in the composition of importing countries has led to a redirection of global oil flows um, and also a fragmentation of Russia's export market into two uh, different geographic segments um, which feature very different um, price and uh, demand dynamics. Now, the demand side obviously has also responded to the developments uh, over the past couple of years with several policy interventions in order to promote uh, the stability of uh, the global oil market and to counter global inflationary um, pressures. And I will uh, limit myself to discussing just two here. Um, the first one is the EU embargo and uh, the G7 oil price cap that was introduced in um, December of last year. Now, the underlying idea of the price cap is that Russia still has access to Western shipping services, um, but only if um, the cargoes that carry Russian oil um, are sold at or below um, the price cap, which is currently um, at $60 a barrel. 
Now, the objective here is a dual one. On the one hand, uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, the market uh, remains well supplied and avoid a, a price spike, um, while at the same time cur curtailing uh, the fiscal revenues uh, for Russia that it uses to finance the war uh, in Ukraine. Now, after six months, um, the six months after its implementation, uh, it's maybe uh, time to take stock of the effectiveness of um, this price cap mechanism. And um, so far, it turns out that um, seaborne export volumes uh, remained relatively stable. Um, and if anything, have increased, as you um, could see on the chart that I showed, uh, showed you before. Uh, and there was also no material impact on um, the global price of crude oil. But there have been important um, impacts on the prices for Russian crude, um, which differ greatly um, across uh, locations. Um, and in fact, as a, as a result of the, uh, the market fragmentation uh, that I mentioned previously. So shipments from the Baltic Sea and uh, the Black Sea now sell at a discount because of the change in customer base. So you need to entice uh, India to, uh, uh, to take over the, the shipments that were lost um, from, um, uh, from the, uh, the EU, while um, transactions that happen in the Pacific Ocean, um, they uh, tend to exceed the, um, the price cap. Now, what did that imply for um, Russia's uh, uh, revenues? Well, at first, in the first quarter of uh, 2023, um, we actually saw a marked decline, but recently um, revenues have been uh, on the rise again, and that's mainly due to the narrowing of the, the price spread um, between uh, Brent and um, the Western benchmark um, at which uh, Russian oil sells, and uh, also um, um, export volumes um, shipped by sea have, um, have increased. Now, the second intervention that I want to talk about um, are the unprecedented releases of oil from government-controlled emergency uh, stockpiles. So what clearly stands out here is the um, large scale and uh, duration of these uh, drawdowns. So for example, um, the US Strategic Petroleum Reserve started from um, 600 million um, uh, barrels uh, in, in the aftermath or during the, um, as, you, as you observe, um, after the recovery from the, the pandemic. Um, and it has uh, decreased to a historic low of 350 um, uh, million barrels right now. But recently, the US has started um, the, the process to refill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which down the road will um, create uh, additional demand for, uh, for crude oil. Now, um, I will now kind of like leave the more physical side of things and uh, turn to prices where we'll decompose the uh, oil price fluctuations associated with the events that I mentioned um, into supply side and uh, demand side um, factors and quantify their contribution um, to um, uh, price, uh, price movement. So uh, here you see the Brent price, which um, reached a trough of $18, $18 a barrel in April and um, peaked at 122 in June of uh, 2022. And um, over this period from April 2020, um, to December 2022, um, where uh, my sample, the sample for my econometric model uh, ends, um, we s saw two episodes where um, supply played a major role. And here I'm filling in um, the quantitative evidence of the narrative that uh, Javier uh, um, mentioned before. So um, when uh, uh, OPEC Plus cut um, production by um, 10 million, doll, doll, 10 million barrels uh, per day uh, in the early stages of the pandemic to lift prices off the floor. So we see that more than um, half of that price increase can be attributed to supply. And the second episode is related um, to the outbreak of the, uh, of the war, where also supply factors are the main driver. Now, we also have one event where supply-side forces prevented prices from falling further, um, which is between October and, uh, and December. Now, over this period, there were three time periods where demand was the dominant factor, accounting for 
um, over 80% of um, price movements um, of, uh, uh, of crude oil. Now, what I want to do next is to, uh, and, and they line up again with the narrative uh, of the, the pent-up demand, and then um, we even see that demand is still the major factor um, in the run-up to the war, so when tensions in December became first apparent, uh, and then um, uh, until the outbreak of the war, and then also when uh, oil prices came down, so it was mainly due to a reduction in, um, in demand. Now, um, what I want to do next is to look at the same periods that um, I examined here for the price movements and to look at the contribution of uh, oil supply and demand shocks to inflation in uh, the U.S. and the euro area. So um, I, I chose as a starting point um, I, I chose a different starting point for the U.S. and the euro area for that first episode that aligns um, with the time when inflation started to overshoot the target because we're interested in um, uh, seeing how much um, oil uh, shocks mattered for um, uh, basically excessive uh, inflation. So um, I just highlighted uh, in the interest of time a few periods here. So what you see or the key takeaway um, from uh, this decomposition is that um, in the initial period, both in the U.S. and the euro area, so um, when we were recovering from the pandemic, oil demand shocks um, contributed uh, substantially to uh, inflation. So in the euro area, it was about um, 50 percent. Um, while most of the time, um, oil supply shocks did not matter that much except um, for um, the early uh, stages of uh, the war in, uh, in Ukraine, um, where they actually made a quite substantial contribution to the additional increases in um, inflation. Now, they are also relevant for um, inflation coming down. So um, uh, inflation came down uh, in, um, uh, in the U.S., um, by uh, 1.3 percentage points in the last quarter of last year, and uh, about half of that um, can be attributed to demand shocks, uh, the contribution in the euro area for that first um, uh, reversal of headline inflation uh, is, a, is a bit smaller. Now, um, however, oil supply shocks is um, what uh, um, keeps policymakers, I guess, uh, awake at night because, as we heard already this morning, they generate a trade-off um, between inflation and um, output stabilization. So um, I want to also look at um, the dynamic effects of uh, um, a 10 percent increase in oil prices due to a supply shock on headline uh, uh, inflation. So um, what you see is that um, both um, in the U.S. and the euro area inflation um, jumps up on impact uh, by relatively similar amounts reflecting um, the energy share of uh, headline inflation. But then the pass-through is much faster in the U.S., while in the euro area um, inflation um, uh, takes a while uh, to, uh, to increase and then is more um, persistent, which points to important um, second round effects. Now, um, an, an important transmission channel um, are inflation expectations, so I also um, want to see how um, they are affected uh, in both areas. And um, here I take one year ahead household inflation expectations, which as you can see react much more strongly um, on impact in the U.S., but then um, the effect dies out uh, relatively quickly. Whereas, um, once again, in the, in the euro area, the buildup is much more um, gradual and uh, long-lasting, which uh, seems to suggest that higher oil prices get much more ingrained in expectations in the euro area compared um, to, uh, to the U.S. And um, I want to, um, I also have evidence for the long run uh, market based uh, expectations, but uh, there the effect is, uh, is much smaller, um, albeit uh, very uh, persistent. But so the last thing that I want to um, point out, and I'm going to wrap up with that, is um, that something that matters a lot 
um, for um, for the euro area is, of course, um, that we're looking here at um, the area-wide response of inflation expectations. But underlying this response is a lot of cross-country heterogeneity. And um, here I show you evidence for um, the 19 member countries. So I apologize to Croatia. Um, I excluded it because it only um, uh, uh, joined the, uh, or adopted the euro um, at the beginning of this year. So, but what you see here is that the sensitivity of inflation expectations um, varies quite a bit across member countries, both in terms of the magnitude, which you see on the left panel, which is a snapshot at um, a year after uh, uh, the shock for all the countries, um, but also in terms of dynamics, with, which is on the right-hand side. So um, there you see the, uh, the month of the maximum response, which tells you something about um, the speed of, uh, of pass-through. Um, so uh, I just um, uh, guess uh, I, I'm going to leave you with, uh, um, with that uh, impression of the, uh, of the heterogeneity, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christiane. So our third panelist is Miguel Riltertre, who is a chief economist in the Directorate General for Energy at the European Commission. So he is uh, um, the person responsible for modeling the impact of energy-related policy proposals and for ensuring that they are economically coherent. So he's a very important person at the Commission. And um, Miguel will uh, briefly review the Russian gas crisis and the uh, EU's uh, policy uh, response. But then he will also analyze implications of the change in the energy mix, offering a longer-term perspective of the green transition. So it's great to have you here, Miguel. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Indeed, I mean, my first message today is that last year, energy crisis was not related to the green transition. It was not a clean energy or a clean technologies crisis, but clearly a Russian natural gas crisis. There are three reasons why prices increased very significantly during 2021 and 2022. The first one, the very significant reduction in supply from Russia. We went from importing 45, around 45, 40% of natural gas supplies from Russia to around less than 10% today, so from 155 billion cubic meters to less than 40 today. The second reason was the uncertainty and the fear of shortages that ensued, and in particularly this uh, you can see in the slide uh, in the period between July and September 2022. And the third reason is the lower than usual hydro and nuclear output for electricity in the summer as well that push natural gas consumption for electricity generation. So this increase in the prices of natural gas drove the increase in electricity prices, and that had effects on the overall economy. Had we had more renewable energy sources, we would have been able to displace gas a longer number of hours from our electricity generation mix. If we would have had more solutions like heat pumps for heating our homes, we would have had lower demand for gas, and therefore prices would have been lower. So on the contrary, clean technologies would have shielded us better. Now, if we look at this period in summer 2022, I think it's important also to mention that prices above global uh, levels were instrumental in attracting liquefied natural gas, but the extremely high prices that we paid between July and September 2022 were not strictly necessary from the point of view of security or supply. The high spike that we saw in the summer of 2022 was due to intra-EU competition in this context of uh, fears of shortages that met with infrastructure bottlenecks in the northwestern region in Europe. I mean, since then, a lot of new LNG terminals have been built. The capacity to bring flows uh, uh, in the northwestern Europe uh, region uh, has eased and is better, but other parts of the world were not paying these very high prices that we paid in the summer of 2022. And this, as Javier was mentioning before, benefited mainly those trading uh, the assets. Now, what about next winter 
So here we come with the, with the positive news. Similar spikes as those that we experienced in 2022 are less probable this year, all things being equal, for five reasons. The first one is the high storage levels. If we continue with the refilling of the storages as we are doing today and we have a framework, uh, the EU adopted a framework about minimum storage levels, uh, by mid-August, end of August, our storages are going to be full. Therefore, we will need less gas uh, during the winter 23-24. The second reason relates to natural gas demand reduction. We have a framework in place. Uh, we have consistently reduced by 18-19% our consumption of natural gas. And part of it uh, is a structural. I mean, prices have gone down. We're still with uh, high prices. So we are not seeing demand uh, coming, coming back. And certainly something very important, it was not the weather. I mean, this we need to be very clear because there are a lot of narratives out there saying that Europe got lucky. I mean, the five years previous to the to the um, uh, to 2022, uh, 2023, to this winter were not that uh, you know that uh, let's say uh, warmer. For uh, sorry, third element, more infrastructure has been added to remove bottlenecks. We have 30 BCM billion cubic meters additional regasification capacity in the EU. This has been delivered in a record time. By 24, 25, we will have 45 BCM, so we will be able to accommodate more liquefied natural gas. And there has also been an acceleration in the deployment of renewables with 56 gigawatt of uh, additional capacity. And the fourth reason is that uh, there is a lower possibility uh, from Russia to weaponize uh, energy markets. As I said, I mean, they have moved from 45% of our supply of natural gas to less than 10% today. And finally, a very important point again, less uncertainty. There is no fear of shortages. I mean, these reports about you know, European homes not being able to heat uh, or uh, you know, blackouts in the electricity system have been avoided and they don't seem to be coming back. Now, if we look at three lessons that we learned from the crisis, uh, the first one I alluded already to, which is the fact that more renewable energy sources can help limiting price spikes due to fossil fuels if they are able to displace the num uh, gas from, uh, from, the electricity, from the electricity generation, but it will take time. And I think it's important to understand that by 2030, and this is you know, the modeling we have done with, with my team, while renewables are expected to provide more than two thirds of the electricity, fossil fuels would still set electricity prices during half of the hours, and even increasing in some member states. So we need to accelerate very much this deployment of renewable energy sources to be able to grasp the benefits of their lower generation, generation cost. Now, the second element is that the pass-through from wholesale to retail energy prices differs very significantly across member states. Why? Because actually, uh, it's just a fraction of the, of, the, of the retail price, the wholesale price. I mean, one third are taxes. So this is something that helped member states in, uh, you know, in, in addressing the crisis. But the way this taxation um, happens is very different across, uh, across member states and therefore led to a significant heterogeneity in the way prices for energy responded. And the third element is that futures, while you know, an important indicator on market expectations and reflecting market sentiment, in a context of a turbulent market, they need to be complemented with an analysis looking at supply, for instance, you know, the additional capacity coming from LNG terminals, and demand condition, lower demand due to the installation of uh, heat pumps. Now, if uh, we look at the future, the energy sector is undergoing a massive structural change. Javier alluded to it. Uh, at some point, I mean, oil is going to lose uh, its, uh, its importance. We need to look increasingly at renewable energy sources and electrification. So three uh, elements or three very important factors is that we will have less energy consumption in the future. The total energy consumption will decrease uh, by one third uh, in the EU by, 20, uh, by 2030. Second element, electrification. The share of electricity in the final energy consumption uh, would increase from 23 to 33 uh, percent in 2030 and 60% as I said before in 2050, more renewables and less gas to the mix. 
and obviously when we analyze prices for energy, we need to look at these important, at these important changes. An important slide uh, from, uh, from my side is that there is clearly a need to differentiate the short-term contribution of energy to inflation from the long-term structural changes from the green transition in relative prices. Uh, as the previous speaker has mentioned, there's going to be more regular price uh, spikes in the future if there are mismatches uh, of, uh, of uh, supply and demand of uh, fossil fuels. And, uh, and this can happen irrespective of the, of the green transition. So it's important when we analyze the prices of energy to differentiate these two aspects. And also important to differentiate the impacts during the transition from the structural effects once the transition has been, uh, has been achieved. And given the large number of different effects, when looking at, the, at uh, these price impacts, it's important to look at you know, different dimensions. First of all, commodities. In the future, the central assumption is that prices paid uh, by the EU on both fossil fuels and critical and raw materials necessary for the green transition will be set in international markets. The green transition requires technologies that are very mineral intensive, and the EU depends very heavily on a few countries for these critical raw materials. For instance, the EU gets 98% of, of its uh, rare earth supply and 93% of its magnesium from China alone. At the same time, we will still need diminishing volumes of fossil fuels during the whole transition. And as shown by, this, uh, you know, by the recent crisis that we had, this can have a very significant impact on electricity prices, even if they are diminishing. The second point is that in order to reduce vulnerabilities, since I mean, we need to work on diversification. We need to work as much as we can with supply, but we have limited possibility to impact supply. We need to work on lowering demand and electrification. There, as I mentioned before, there's going to be a lower demand for energy in the future, and there is also uh, the development of energy efficiency solutions. Demand response and self-consumption are going to be extremely important. Lower cost on electricity driven by renewables, I already alluded to. Replacement of capital stock and infrastructure. Uh, according to our modeling, uh, in the energy sector alone, we will need 487 billion uh, euros of investments per year. This can push prices up of uh, green goods, and moving before other regions in the world can moderate these price tensions. Shortages on the skilled labor force might create also upward pressure on, on prices but there will be ultimately a readjustment on relative prices. Carbon pricing and taxation, increasing the cost of carbon can have an important uh, uh, impact uh, on, on prices. Using the revenues for public investment in clean technologies could lead to a positive supply shock. And the current taxation systems in member states, they need to be adapted. Because currently fossil fuels are heavily, heavily subsidized, while at the same time electricity is heavily taxed. And therefore, should taxation on electricity decrease in the future, this can have a downward impact on prices. And finally, uncertainty and higher risk premiums, changes in the cost uh, of capital can impact uh, the future energy system. Certainty is crucial. So my conclusion is that poorly sequenced or erratic changes during the transition will be accompanied by episodes of very volatile prices. Policy choices matter. We need to avoid uncertainty as much as possible, cheap and stable access to commodities, manage demand, and install renewable energy sources as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel, for a very interesting uh, presentation. And my uh, final speaker uh, is Ida Wolden uh, Backe. Uh, who's governor of the Central Bank uh, of Norway, uh, which is a country that was very differently affected by the energy price shock. And Ida will bring the perspective from a major energy exporting uh, economy. And uh, as a central banker, I assume you will also talk about the implication for, uh, the, for monetary policy. So Ida, the floor is yours. We're very much looking forward to hearing your insights. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this uh, distinguished panel. So in my remarks, I will offer 
some thoughts on how the structural changes in energy markets will affect energy prices and inflation more generally, before turning to some implications for monetary policy. But let me start by sharing some observations on my home country. Now, Norway is an energy nation and a large exporter of oil. Over the past decade, natural gas exports have increased in importance. Also, Norway is highly integrated in the European energy market, primarily as an exporter of oil and gas, but increasingly also as a, an important supplier of flexible hydroelectric power. Now, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Norway has become Europe's largest single gas supplier. A close cooperation with Europe reflects our common interest in well-functioning energy markets during the transition to zero emissions. Now, in the years to come, Norway's, the petroleum sector's significance to the Norwegian economy will likely decline as resources on the Norwegian continental shelf are depleted. And lower activity in the petroleum sector will have implications for the Norwegian business structure. Substantial investments and reallocation of labor and other resources across sectors and firms may be required. But along this path, the green energy transition can be a catalyst. And we're already seeing that technology developed in the petroleum sector serves as a springboard for new jobs in the green sector. So turning to uh, the next topic, how are structural changes in energy markets shaping the outlook for energy prices and inflation in more general? And on this is my time uh, to be humble and say that predicting the energy prices in the years to come is extremely hard. As we've already heard, different aspects of the transition are likely to affect different prices differently uh, and possibly with opposite signs. And outcomes will depend on developments of technology, the supply of raw materials and minerals, and on political decisions, not only related to the climate, but also related to energy security. While recognizing that uncertainty, I think in the short to medium term, it would be prudent to be prepared for, at least, a potentially higher frequency of, of negative and possibly more persistent supply side shocks originating in the energy market. Now, with an increasing share of intermittent renewables in the energy mix and in insufficient energy storage system to act as balancing mechanisms, supply could become more unpredictable. And coupled with low demand elasticities, short-run fluctuations in supply could potentially trigger large price movements, reinforcing a well-documented characteristic of energy markets. Now turning to how this might impact inflation, although household energy costs constitute a fairly modest share of the CPI basket, as we all experienced last year, large movement in energy prices can have a material impact on headline inflation. And energy prices, as we've also heard earlier today, can also have an indirect effect through firms' input costs. And large and potentially more persistent changes in energy prices may limit firms' ability to absorb such large costs via lower profit margins. And the pass-through from firms' impost costs and ultimately to consumer price inflation may then be amplified. Large and more persistent energy price changes could also amplify second round effects. For instance, by affecting inflation expectations. Recent research that we've already heard, at, and, but also at Norges Bank, have found that household expectations play a key role in amplifying the pass-through of oil price shocks to inflation. And this is particularly the case when oil price changes are large and persistent. On the other hand, 
and contrarywise, at least some of the path through to core inflation will be counteracted by the disinflationary effect of lower income and a fall in demand. As many households are credit constraints and consume mainly out of current income, larger and more persistent energy price movements could therefore potentially amplify the contractionary effect on consumption. So how will this affect monetary policy going forward? Now first, central banks need to deepen their understanding of the functioning of energy markets. And we need to integrate that knowledge into our analytical framework. The effects of and the efforts to combat climate change might change the structure of our economies in ways that reduce the relevance of existing models based on historical data. And furthermore, going forward, it will be crucial to identify the source and the nature of the shock behind the energy price movements in real time. And this may become more challenging as the green transition involves a wide range of sectors and products. So to help us navigate, we need more research, possibly new analytical tools and new models. Now central banks are not unfamiliar with fluctuations in energy prices. But should the frequency and persistence of supply shocks in the energy market increase ahead, we may be faced more often with a challenging short-term trade-off between stabilizing output and stabilizing inflation. And deciding on the right timing and dosage of monetary policy will be crucial. As we've heard earlier today, the appropriate response of monetary policy to energy prices will depend on the source and the nature and the duration of the shock. It will also depend on whether energy price shocks fuel inflation via second order effects, including through inflation expectations. And failing to respond to such second order effects, we may risk persistent overshoots of our inflation targets and ultimately a de-anchoring of inflation expectations. On the other hand, wrongly interpreting temporary movements in energy prices as having persistent effects. We could incur larger output losses in the short term and may even increase inflation volatility. Moreover, changes in relative prices, for instance, due to higher carbon prices, are effective signals that drive the transition in the right direction. An appropriately flexible and forward-looking monetary policy would help those necessary changes in relative prices to feed through. But, flex but flexibility must not come at the expense of credibility. In presence of structural changes and large uncertainties, such as those created by climate change, well-anchored inflation expectations remain as important, important as ever. I'll stop there. Thank you. So thank you very much to the, to the four panelists for excellent presentations. Actually, I, uh, if I may, I would like to start from a, a comment made by uh, Ida. So um, you basically said that you would expect there to be um, more frequent and more persistent energy price shocks or, I mean, during the transition period. And I, I would like to hear uh, whether the others uh, agree to that or how you would see that, how the structure of the, the markets uh, affects that. And then uh, maybe also to, to Miguel, because you took a bit the longer term uh, perspective, what is going to happen uh, after that and how long is, uh, do you think this transition period is going to be? So if whoever wants to, wants to come in. 
Yes, I guess the question was No, it's the actually more to, now more to uh, the others because yeah. you made this But statement. let me just uh, yes. emphasize that uh, at least I think, I mean, there's great uncertainty about the, uh, sure. about the outlook for energy prices. Uh, but I think it would be prudent to at least prepare for the possibility that we might see um, more persistent uh, and more frequent uh, negative supply shocks in energy markets. But that's not a given that that will actually happen. in terms of my more current analysis of how the major oil producers are shifting in, in terms of uh, um, the, the, the market structure and uh, uh, the way. So they kind of like uh, becoming in a way more prone um, to um, supply disruptions. And so, um, yeah, I would kind of like um, uh, share the view that, uh, that Ida uh, mentioned that uh, uh, supply shocks are going to be more frequent, and it is uh, indeed uh, prudent to uh, uh, to prepare for that possibility. And you're talking about the oil line market specifically. Yes, but I think it's uh, it's a broader general. phenomenon. So, um, okay, yeah. so Javier, I fully agree with with the comment that Ida made, and I mean one of the difficulties, in particular in the electricity market, to predict where the price and the supply and demand is going to be is that you need to take a view on the weather. You need to forecast what the weather is going to look like. Uh, two weeks from now, and that is very, very difficult uh, beyond uh, any, any, most of the tools that we have. Uh, it was the case that we have only to model uh, the weather because of the demand. Is it going to be hot? We are going to need more demand for air conditioning. Is it going to be cold? We are going to need a lot more demand for heating. But today, increasingly, we need to model also for supply. Is it going to be windy? Is it going to be sunshine? Is it going to be cloudy? We're going to have a reduction in, in, in solar production is becoming more and more important in many European countries, particularly in the south. And that is having an impact. And, and the, the, the impact of weather, both on the supply and on the demand, and the difficulty to predict weather more than 10 days ahead makes that more difficult. The solution will be a storage, but we are not there yet. Thank you very much. Maybe you can also comment a bit on this you know, the, the longer term perspective that maybe is, uh, is, is a more benign one, actually. If, uh, well, I mean, I think there are two sources of volatility that we might see in the years to come. I and mean, one which was alluded is the mismatch between supply and demand related to fossil fuels. Uh, and also the fact that concentration of these diminishing volumes of fossil fuels might, you know, be in two or three uh, countries in the, in the world mainly. And then there is the volatility that is inherent to the, to the clean technologies that Javier was alluding to. It's the fact that if there is no wind, if there is no sun, we might need you know, other, other things there. Innovation, demand response, flexibility, batteries are extremely, are extremely important. And also, as I mentioned in my presentation, to secure this base load that you need for electricity, be it gas, be it nuclear, that would still be, be needed. Now, what, uh, on, the, on the benign side, because you were asking about that, we are seeing an acceleration of the deployment of clean technologies after this crisis. I mean, this uh, I mentioned before, we are in a record level of the deployment of renewables. We're also in record level in several member states on the deployment of heat pumps and other solutions. So this part on the electric... Lost. And uh, um, I mean, will require also a very significant investment on grids that we are not seeing, but I think in several member states might come you know, earlier than expected. So by 2030, 2031, 2032, we will start seeing dramatic changes. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned the investment that is needed. There's of course one debate ongoing whether uh, central banks by raising interest rates forcefully, whether we may actually make this transition uh, harder. To, uh, maybe, I don't know, Ida, do you have a view on this? Well, I guess uh, higher real rates would make all investments uh, more expensive. So it, it's uh, not obvious to me, although the horizons might differ, of course, uh, how this will, will play out. But I nevertheless think that the most important contribution, uh, contribution we can uh, make is to make sure that inflation is low and stable, as that would also uh, benefit those, uh, those investments. Uh, and then providing for a stable economy and low inflation is, is uh, perhaps more important uh, in the long term. Yeah, very good point. Any other comments you would like to make to each other after your excellent mm -hmm. presentations? 
I would like to follow up on uh, um, on one po I mean, uh, point that uh, uh, Miguel made, uh, which is about the um, uh, uh, the pass that the pass through uh, from whole uh, wholesale to retail prices uh, uh, differs across member states. So, uh, uh, which uh, is the case in, in in different energy markets. So that was my uh, my last point also about the, the heterogeneity in the in the pass through and. Um, it's important to um, be mindful of the fact that this depends very much on the economic structure. So we have been talking about structural changes in the energy markets, but we also need to take structural changes in uh, economies with regard to uh, the energy mix into account, which is, for example, one um, factor that determines heterogeneity in, in pass-through. Others are kind of like uh, uh, changes in, or in the industry uh, composition, uh, the competitiveness of the environment, uh, or, yeah, kind of like so how competitive the, uh, um, the environment is um, in, in which firms are operating, uh, and also uh, national uh, government policies like uh, energy subsidies, taxes, and things like that. So there is a scope also for, I guess, um, some uh, policy interventions that could uh, kind of like uh, make, make countries more converge on that uh, uh, on that front, which then should also make the uh, the job for um, the ECB easier, kind of like to uh, um, intervene in, in the case of uh, uh, the more frequent uh, um, energy supply shocks that, that might happen down the road. So uh, I just wanted to reinforce that point because uh, I think uh, it's it's important. Yeah, that's an, I, I think that's an excellent comment because indeed, you know, of course, we've been struggling quite a bit with all these heterogeneities across different countries with the very different speed of the path through that was also shown in the slides. And uh, I, I think that's an extremely important point. I, I will perhaps make a, a quick point on following on, on Miguel's comments about the lack of uh, forecast power of the forward curve in commodity markets. And I, I think that a lot of the uh, errors on, on inflation forecasting uh, across the industry, not just in central banking, uh, my own included, um, over the last few months have been for relying too much on forward curves as an input for our inflation forecast. I know that if we take away the, infla the, the curve and what we replace that with, uh, and, and I don't have a very good answer on that, but I know that uh, perhaps relying too much on forward curves is, is, is making us uh, predicting uh, inflation only. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we've had that discussion also <laughs> internally, if I may say. But um, actually, you mentioned that uh, you, you are doing analysis that goes beyond the forward curve, so that you are looking at, um, you know, uh, what are the expectations about mm -hmm. how demand and supply is going to develop. So do you have anything to offer to us, what we can use instead of futures curves? Well, I mean, we're working with my team uh, very much, and we are in touch with the teams in the, in the ECB on, on, on this. But uh, it's, it's basically to have a qualitative assessment on the supply and the demand conditions. I mean, if we know that the storages are going to be full by the end of August and that we might not need that much gas, we can have an assumption that prices might decrease for natural gas. I mean, this is one of the scenarios that we are developing uh, ourselves for the, for the end of August and the beginning of, uh, the beginning of September, all things being equal, considering, you know, as I mentioned, demand conditions that we don't need that much gas anymore, the forecasts that we had also on the, on the weather. So all of these elements, they allow to a little bit, uh, you know, in a sense, qualify what the, what the forward curves uh, are telling us. Yeah. No, I mean, it's actually, I, I find it quite fascinating to see that now we are becoming so dependent on, on weather. I mean, weather uh, affects energy yes. prices more and more, but of course it also affects food prices. At the same time, we're seeing all these things happening with uh, El Nino, with climate change, and all, all these things. I mean, that is interesting that the weather is going to be one of the major uh, uncertainties going forward. And uh, I think probably we, we are not going to be better uh, in forecasting the weather than we are at uh, forecasting other things. So that's, that's it's a bit concerning. But uh, any other comments or shall we open the floor? Just Ida. one uh, yes. brief uh, remark. And, uh, and uh, what, what my fellow panelists reminded us uh, is that it's, it's obvious, of course, but there's not just one energy price or one energy market. And I think uh, my panelists did a good job of, of uh, explaining that and why we also need to expand our analysis at central banks and recognizing that different markets uh, affect different firms and different sectors of the economy differently. 
which also makes this um, quite a challenge. All right, so uh, let's go to the, um, uh, to the floor for question. So I don't see any question for, uh, on Zoom. Uh, so please, yes. We need a mic, actually we have three questions right here. We collect the three. Yes, Richard, do you too? I don't know who wants to start, so Xavier. Thank you, Fernanda Guardado from the Central Bank of Brazil. We can definitely see how we are depending on the weather. We have a lot of hydrological power uh, and when there's a drought, we get very strong increases. But I wanted to dial back to Ida's comment on uh, the shocks becoming more frequent. So making a link with that with the first panel uh, and trying to identify whether shocks are temporary or kind of frequent enough to be considered permanent, um, would you say that maybe this is one area where we should consider a, f a higher frequency of shocks in prices of energy and oil to be more permanent and include that in, uh, in our framework in such a way that this is maybe uh, requiring higher neutral interest rates so that we don't pass through the volatility from oil prices and energy prices into monetary policy. So maybe this is a more permanent uh, development and maybe this should be included as such in our evaluation. So uh, maybe if you want to comment on yes, that. Yes, very, very interesting question. Xavier Vives from uh, ESA Business School. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, go back uh, to the relationship between the green transition and the pricing dynamics, which you have, uh, I mean, most of you uh, touch open, um, because this is gonna definitely be tricky. And one issue which I am not clear, and I would like to see your opinion, is that, well, we all agree that we have to decrease know, the use of uh, fossil fuels, no? But how to manage the transition uh, and the needed investment still in those fossil fuels so that the light's still gone always, basically, no? Uh, um, and in this respect, uh, I, I think, uh, Miguel, so you, you have pointed out that the role of uh, the Russian aggression on, on the uh, natural gas, uh, gas prices and so on. Uh, but if we look at 2021, the year before, prices of energy were going up. This was not Russia. Uh, and uh, it was because of weather, obviously, uh, the weather, the increase in demand in Asia, but also because of the increase in the prices of CO2, uh, which, which that's what we have to do, right? The prices of CO2 have to go up. So, so here we, we have some dynamics, no? That uh, what, uh, how to ensure, no? That uh, that this goes as smoothly as possible. Yes, very good question again, Richard. Please. Thank you, Richard Portis, London Business School. Um, a quick remark on the weather. Ken Arrow did weather forecasting uh, during the war. Forty years later, he said that it hadn't improved beyond 48 hours weather forecasting hadn't improved at all. Um, two questions for Javier. Uh, I was struck, really struck, by the uh, information you gave us about the commodity trading houses. And now I understand why Glencore is so often in the financial pages uh, of the newspapers. But um, first of all, do you think that these activities, that the trading house activities, um, actually contribute to arbitrage to a positive um, you know, to s some positive consequences in the markets. And second, um, this huge increase in their revenues, can you tell us anything about who's actually paying that? What's the distributional effect of this immense rise in the revenues of the trading houses? All right, so who would like to take any, any of the questions? Yes, please. I can, I can start. I mean, with uh, with the point that Xavier was uh, was mentioning. I mean, I think we need to provide as much certainty as possible and clarity on what are what is the demand we are going to have for fossil fuels, and enter as we are doing it already. I mean, with our joint purchasing mechanism, you know, from the Commission, entering into partnerships with countries in the world that would have to supply us, so that they know until when we will need these amounts of fossil fuels, so that investment can follow. 
investment not necessarily in new drilling and uh, you know new but keeping simply you know the the facilities uh, now an important point from from my side is that i mean prices already in the summer of 2021 were increasing due to Russia. It was not, you know, uh, the prices increased at the moment of the aggression of Ukraine. In August 2021, we started noticing that the storages in several member states that should have been filled by gas coming from Russia were not being filled. And that's what puts us in a difficult situation because we ended up in the, in the winter 21-22 with storages only filled at 30%. And that, uh, you know, puts us in a, in a, in a lot of difficulties. And, and related to the ETS price, I would say the same. I mean, we need to provide certainty. We believe in this tool; it's a market tool, and uh, I, mean, I, I, I think it's uh, I think it's delivering. We need to be as certain as possible about you know what is the path on the on the allowances. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So, uh, do you want to take the monetary policy question? Or? It was a very interesting question, but one that is give, uh, difficult to give a definite answer to, uh, in the sense, I think in real time it will be very challenging, of course, to identify whether a shock is temporary or, or permanent, as we've already uh, discussed this morning. And then I think there's, a, in general, a, a very interesting question uh, related to the transformation of energy markets and the green transition uh, and what, how, um, if that would impact a neutral rate of interest. Uh, I think is an ongoing discussion uh, where there are effects could draw in potentially different directions. So that's for next year's panel. <laughs> Javier? Uh, yeah. uh, thank you for the questions, very, very pertinent questions. Uh, if you want to ask, um, thinking about is a positive arbitrage for society and the economy, if you ask that question inside the industry, they will tell you that they are the visible manifestation of the invisible hand that they are doing the, the job of the market and they are di redistributing commodities. Certainly the industry is as old as mankind, commerce and trading commodities. We started with the stones and copper and iron and we have continued now with everything else. Uh, there is an, a degree of need of the industry and certainly at times, last year in particular, there was a need to reshuffle global trade of commodities. Oil from Russia was not coming to Europe anymore. It was sent to India, where it's refined, transformed into diesel, and then re-exported to, to Europe. Whether that's a good policy, I will leave it to the room. But there was a need for the traders. The question is, are they profiting in excess? Uh, the, the, in, in the commodity trading regulation in the United States, there is a terminology that is excessive speculation. Was excessive arbitrage on the industry? Looking at the profitability, one will think that, that the, 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 the profits, at least, were, were quite good. And in terms of who is paying for this, well, uh, it's coming from consumers, it's coming from producers. Mainly, uh, if I look at last year, uh, my, my initial reaction was that most of the profit was coming from consumers, where the consumers paying for those extra profits. And I will make uh, an additional point here. Uh, I'm going to get a lot of emails from the CEOs of some of the commodity trading houses for this, but I will say nonetheless, uh, in Europe, we discussed and implemented some windfall taxes on the profits of big oil companies, big gas companies, and included, we cap the profitability of some green energy generators, particularly in the wind industry. There was no windfall tax on the commodity trading industry, mostly because it's located in uh, Switzerland, and also headquartered in Switzerland, but very important, most of the times the final incorporation of those companies is often on uh, low tax jurisdictions, Singapore, British Virgin Islands, uh, Cyprus. And um, so that was one point. And because they operate from those locations, the tax that they pay to society is relatively low. The, the average uh, tax margin for these companies is about 10%. Uh, Wall Street pays about 25%, Wall Street banks. They, they compare very well with Goldman Sachs in terms of taxation. And I will leave it there before I get more emails. <laughs> so I, I have three further uh, speakers. I know uh, everybody is hungry. So, uh, okay, four. <laughs> I have four. Uh, I close the list here. So I have um, uh, Anil first, then Daniel, then Lucrezia, then um, Joachim. Anil Cash at University of Chicago. Uh, this is for Miguel and anybody else who wants to answer. I mean, the one thing that hasn't come up this far is it makes no sense for a lot of the fossil fuel company, uh, countries to leave it in the ground. 
So at some point, their, their incentives to try to harvest some of that revenue before things become completely inviable kicks in. And I'm just wondering how you're thinking about modeling that. And I, Ida must be thinking about this for Norway. You guys are trying to go green, but it, at some point there is going to be a tipping point. And I just wonder what you're, where, where that comes into your calculations. Thank you. Yeah, my man, <coughs> my demand. Is in, my question is, in a certain sense, a direct follow-up and comes back to this uh, key question for monetary policy, whether the shocks are temporary or permanent. And uh, my question would be to Jill to ask, is there any indication that uh, the oil price, maybe the gas price, is a random walk? So most shocks are permanent. Or do you see evidence of some equilibrium price towards which the daily price tends to return after a shock. Maybe a, an equilibrium price which varies over time, but nevertheless something which would imply that most shocks are transitory. Yeah. To Lucrezia, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I have one question for the central bankers and one observation. <laughs> uh, the question is that um, there is work on optimal inflation targeting uh, that uh, relates the trend in relative prices to the optimal inflation target. So that you want to minimize distortion uh, and then uh, when there are you know, trends in relative prices, you want to have a higher average uh, inflation level for that reason. So it seems to me that that work would be relevant uh, to think about the future you know, level of inflation target, if you think, I mean, the long term, I'm not saying that you have to change it now, but uh, you know, thinking of the type of shocks uh, that uh, you are discussing. So the question is, uh, are you thinking about that? Is there any analysis uh, in-house? And the observation is that actually the weather forecast has become much, much better. So that's, that's uh, <laughs> unlike economic forecast. So that's good news. <laughs> Joachim, please. Joachim Nagel, Deutsche Bundesbank. Um, regarding the perception of the energy market, I believe that central banks are definitely not in the driver's seat when it comes to energy market. I think we are used to the volatility of the energy market since 50 years, more or less, so we have to deal with the fallout. We are pretty good in this. This is my understanding here. But what is obvious that the energy market is very opaque, it's not transparent, and it asks for much more regulation. And as I said, we are not in the driver's seat, so we have to ask who is in the driver's seat. And I believe that politics is here in the driver's seat. It is a little bit the same compared to the fragmentation when we're talking about the capital market union. At least I can say that for the European Union. I think the energy market is even worse. So we have to discuss this uh, fragmentation and we have really to get better here. And this is one of the major challenges I see here. But as I said, central banks, we can ask for that, let me say, homogeneity and reduce the, uh, let me say, heterogeneous situation. But I think the task is on the political, it's in the political arena. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a final round of responses, wherever you, uh, whoever you would like to respond to. Uh, on the final comment on, 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 on regulation, uh, as I said, I, I think that the first step to me is, is oversight and increased transparency. Uh, we, we cannot regulate what we don't know how it was, so we, we need to get better data. And, and I think that what it was concerning to me looking at the reaction of policymakers in 2022 in particular was that at some point they were blind. They didn't know what was happening and they didn't know what they were missing. And, um, uh, and I think that improving that transparency and getting more information of the sector it will be a very good first step. And then we can decide that we're actually, when we have that information, whether we need the regulation or not. But I think that the first step is increase the transparency. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I, um, I'm gonna um, speak a little bit, which is actually outside my um, uh, usual field, but uh, I, I have some views on uh, the energy transition and kind of like speaking to, uh, uh, to Anil's question to some extent, but also following up on uh, uh, on what Miguel said. Uh, so I'm, um, 
less optimistic relative to uh, uh, Miguel about uh, how fast we're going to accomplish that. And I think one important thing that has not been mentioned uh, uh, yet is that we need to take into account um, the, uh, uh, the purpose for which we use um, fossil fuels, right? So you mentioned uh, heat pumps, for example, but I'm thinking, yet coming from the oil angle, more of transportation, um, where there start to be uh, kind of like substitutes with uh, uh, electric vehicles and stuff, but um, to make, to, to uh, scale that up basically is gonna be, in my view, a much longer term process. And so uh, the tipping point that, uh, that you mentioned, Anil, I think is still, uh, in my view, far off. So kind of like, a, and uh, that's why, uh, in a way, um, the uh, oil producing nation still gonna try and take advantage of it. But they are facing their own structural issues, as I mentioned, right? So kind of like this uh, years of underinvestment, uh, and they have to make the difficult decision in the end, is it worth it? And kind of like, what is the planning uh, horizon, right? So, uh, um, and uh, I guess they, they have to, to find a balance there and, and make their cost benefit analysis and, and um, yeah, decide based on that. Okay. Yes, thank you. So first on the, on the point that Javier was mentioning, I think uh, definitely it's super important to have standardized monitoring and supervision of trading houses. I, I think you know, at some point, as, as Javier was mentioning, there was a certain blindness in the, in, the, in the policy making because it was not clear who was trading what, under which conditions, you know, what price, which volumes. I mean, getting this information up to date was not possible. And it's not possible because we have different regulatory regimes, uh, you know, nationally, but also at the European level. And the, the question on the, on the tipping point, I think there, uh, as I said before, we might not be able ourselves to influence a lot of supply of fossil fuels. What we can is influence demand. Uh, because in Europe, we are importers of, uh, of, uh, of commodities. So I think providing this certainty to those producers that sell their fossil fuels to us is extremely, is extremely, is extremely important. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the, for the question. Uh, the, the literature on, on optimal inflation targets is, is, is indeed uh, an interesting one. I think now, for the time being, for uh, most central banks, and Norges Bank is no exception, uh, our sole focus is on getting inflation back to target. But it has, um, it adds to uh, the trade-offs that we might be facing going forward in the face of cost push shocks and in the face of supply shocks in energy markets that we do need to be uh, sufficiently forward-looking uh, so as to allow those relative price changes, including those from carbon uh, pricing, to, to feed through. So I think it's an interesting debate. Uh, but for now, uh, I think we are <coughs> focused on our main objective of getting inflation back to target. So thank you very much. I think we have to come to a close. Everybody's hungry now. Let me just uh, say a few words what I am taking away from, um, uh, from uh, this uh, session. Um, so uh, I think what's also uh, shown by uh, Christiana that it seems that the supply of fossil fuels is becoming less uh, elastic, which has... Uh, which uh, also leads to this higher elasticity, uh, the higher volatility uh, in fossil fuel uh, prices. The panel is of the view that we are going to face more frequent and more uh, persistent energy price shocks um, uh, due to uh, the mismatch between supply and uh, demand due to what's happening at uh, OPEC, uh, due to uh, the weather. Um, so this is, of course, uh, creating uh, challenges uh, for us. I, I think I agree with uh, Joachim that uh, I mean, we have to deal with it, but we cannot solve the, the problems. And so this is clearly up to uh, governments. Um, I think you convinced us that, uh, that uh, the uh, commodity traders need more oversight after we've learned what they're, what they're actually doing, and you've already told us a bit of that. We certainly need infrastructure massively. I mean, we need uh, grids. Um, we need the expansion of uh, renewable uh, energy. Uh, I mean, on the analysis side, we need to integrate uh, the, the energy sector into our models, and of course, we are already uh, doing some, some of that. 
And uh, so there's a lot to do, a lot uh, to learn, many challenges. Thank you very much for sharing your insights. It was uh, a very interesting uh, discussion. I enjoyed it enormously. I hope uh, the rest of you too. I wish you all uh, a very nice rest of the day, also with some social activities, which is new at Sintra. Uh, but I'm going to hand over to Claire now. Thank you very much, Isabel. So that brings to a close the formal proceedings for today's events. I'd like to thank President Lagarde, all of our panelists and our chairs for a great start to the event and with plenty of compelling insights into the not-so-steady state we're in. Um, there's some mixed feelings, I think, about whether or not Godot will show up, but if he does any time soon, I think it's going to be in pay packets or shopping baskets rather than riding in on an oil tanker. So please join us again here in the room tomorrow or online at 9 a.m. We'll also be finding out the winner of this year's Young Economist Prize. And if you haven't already, please do vote for your favorite by 9 a.m. local time tomorrow morning. Thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers.